but I was still really good at fighting. Mm -hmm. And because I was good at fighting, a lot of doors opened for me that wouldn't open for other people. And uh, I got involved in a whole lot of stuff I'm not real proud of. But I did it, you know, and I don't really talk about this about this part of my life much because for one, nobody needs to know it, you know, for two, I'm very ashamed of it. But at some point, somebody's got to wonder what the hell is going on with them, right? So, so, so here it is, because I'm only gonna I'm only gonna do it once, you know. Uh, when you serve forty thousand meals a year to the homeless folks in your community, you cross paths with some very interesting people. Today, we're sharing one of those people with you on the Street Life Ministries podcast. This is a good friend of mine, Kevin Valley, who I've known for many years. Um, Kevin was homeless for several years and now has a relationship with Christ. He's housed and uh, a transformation um, in Christ uh, all rolled into one lovable, joyable uh, Kevin. And um, and um, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Kevin over the several over several years and watched him grow and also have watched him uh, struggle and also change in many ways. And uh, I'm just have a pleasure of doing this podcast. Thanks, man. So, um, first off, where were you born and raised? I was born in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Okay. Where I have absolutely no recollection of it. I don't know what it looks like. Don't know anybody there. Don't know nothing. <laughs> but that's where I was born. My dad was a, uh, uh, what was he called? A uh, uh, battlefield engineer or whatever. And uh, so they built the, the roads that you know, the tanks would go through the rice paddies on. So, not that big a deal, but he, uh, he ended up passing away in a car accident right after my brother was born. And uh, I've seen pictures of the car accident, it's pretty impressive. Uh, I'd be glad, I, I'd, want, I'd, I'd choose death rather than live through that one. That, it, was a, it was a big accident, mm -hmm. a really big accident. And uh, one of the funny parts there is that his car was, uh, well, the cops knew him real well, so I guess I'd find, kind of follow in my father's footsteps because the cops would get down on either end of the block, and when my father would come shooting out with his car, they'd get him on either side of the block. They'd get him two, three times a day sometimes. <laughs> and, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. He was a great guy. He, uh, he sold a car once that did not belong to him uh, when he was sitting at a, at a, uh, like a, a, uh, an auto restaurant somewhere where you can just park and go into some greasy spoon place and I sold somebody a car he'd never met the person whose car it was or anything so my dad was not a great guy um, my my childhood was pretty cool though I mean I came up like anybody else I had, uh, I had a couple of so wait, wait, wait right there so your childhood was pretty cool but where, where was your childhood at Oh, in here in Redwood City, actually. I came here when I was three. Okay, cool. And and I've, I've been here ever since, well, off and on. I, I got away from here, what is it, eight years now? Over at Vicky's. But before that, yeah, I hadn't gone too far. Hmm. So uh, uh, as far as the childhood goes, uh, I was a pretty normal kid. Had uh, <laughs> had a couple of violent tendencies and had to go to play therapy for a long time about it. Um so it's play therapy. Uh, you know what? I never even figured that out, dude. I was just sitting there making sandcastles and stuff, and then they tell me to go home. <laughs> so I, okay. never, I never really knew what that was all about, bro. But Interesting. But yeah, it was apparently because I would get in fights. So the first fight I got into, I was in kindergarten, and I hit somebody with my Fat Albert lunch pail, and those were made of metal back then. Mm. So that's, that dates me right there. And So then I had to go to play therapy. <laughs> so... Uh, I had, I had Scooby-Doo. Yeah, right? So, there so, you go, yeah, bro. So, so I know. See, man? That Albert was just stuff back then, dude. I was real proud of that thing. And I crushed it on this guy. And, and that was kindergarten. So I came up from that, okay? it's uh, I did pretty good until I hit high school. Once I hit high school, I went to... I did a whole tour of high schools, but... Uh, I went from Sarah High School to Woodside High School and, and opened my eyes in Woodside High School to getting stoned at lunch. And after that, every fifth period, I had this, this one English teacher for fifth period and he let me sleep through the class. <laughs> he just realized it was better that way. So 
that's when things started to get funky though, know, because that's when I was starting to get older and, and I really pushed the envelope there. Yeah. So did you did you graduate from Woodside? No, I did not. I never did graduate until I was twenty one. I went and did the the uh, G D and uh, had my graduation day on my twenty first right around my twenty first birthday, so I got to drink legally. Yeah. <laughs> so how was your how was your relationship with your brother? Me and my brother, we always had a real strained relationship, but we're brothers, so of course we would, you know, especially in the come-up time. When you're starting to get your legs underneath you and you're starting to, you know, take all comers and everything, me and my brother, because we were around each other all the time, we ended up kind of just lighting each other up, and, and that's how it worked for us, you know? Yeah. We either got along, it was feast or famine. We got along great or I wanted him dead. It was funny, you yeah. know? And uh, it went like that, shoot. Are you the bigger brother or the younger yeah, brother? I'm, I'm the older brother. I'm yeah. the first one. Okay. First born, yeah. first this, first that, first the other thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, what was what was um, your relationship like with your mom? Well, it was uh, hit and miss, real hit and miss. Yeah. Uh, we would get along, and when we got along, great. But when we didn't, I was back then. I was out of line. I, you know, I, I I wasn't putting up with a whole lot of crap. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't put up with crap from anybody. Not most, least of all, my own family. I didn't realize my mom was trying to mold me into a man. I thought she was just being a real pill. So. <laughs> So I responded the same way you would expect for somebody you think is being a pill. And uh, I think there's there's problems on both sides there. But uh, it got worse and worse yeah. as I got older and older because I was a punk, dude. I was a full-on punk. There's no other way to put it. I, I don't mean a punk like punk rock. I'm talking about a punk like you want to smack him in the head for being an asshole. <laughs> and I just would have deserved it. I, you know, if somebody had done that, my life might have taken a whole different trajectory. <laughs> but there was never anybody big enough to do it. Yeah. And so they never did. Did your mom ever remarry? No. No? She, uh, she was serious with a couple of guys, and one of the guys turned out had an affinity for drinking and driving. She got into an accident, broke mm. her ribs. And that was the last time we saw that dude. Yeah, you know? I bet. Especially yeah. with the past of your dad dying from a car crash. Yeah, I, dude. A little trauma there, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. You know? So, really after you got out of high school and, and uh, were, were doing your thing, what, what kind of, did you get a, a career? Did you start working anywhere? What, what kind of what direction did you start going down? I, <laughs> the exact opposite of the one I'm on now. <laughs> and, uh, well, yes, that, you know, yeah. Because all this freedom and everything just made me want to do more. You yeah. Know, more dope, more drinking, be more stupid than everyone else, be the party guy, and it sucked. It really mm -hmm. sucked. But I was still really good at fighting. Mm -hmm. And because I was good at fighting, a lot of doors opened for me that wouldn't open for other people. And uh, I got involved in a whole lot of stuff I'm not real proud of. But I did it, you know, and I don't really talk about this about this part of my life much because for one, nobody needs to know it, you know. For two, I'm very ashamed of it. But at some point, somebody's got to wonder what the hell is going on with them, right? So, so, so here it is, because I'm only gonna I'm only gonna do it once, you know. Uh, I used to collect drug debts uh, with a group of guys. This group of guys. We're talking. We're not talking about five hundred dollar drug debts. We're talking twenty thousand, sixty thousand, eighty thousand more. And uh, our, our tagline was, "We can get it for you in a half hour." <laughs> and 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 really, we would. But that meant doing things that I can't even begin to to describe. In order to get that, you know, in order to get it in a half hour, you got to make a big deal really quick. And I've always been good at that. And. Uh, we would get 15% of the take, whatever that was. Um, worked out pretty good for a night's work. We Sometimes we'd schedule three or four of them in a day. And so we'd work all day, which was all of about maybe four hours. <laughs> and then we would spend the next week and a half partying and just being idiots. And it was the amount of money that we were making for something we really didn't consider anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you owe the money, pay the money, you know. And, but it's a lot like they say in, uh, you know, I don't know the, I don't remember the movie offhand, Goodfellas. 
where he says, you know, uh, uh, life feeding you lemons, screw you, pay me. <laughs> you know, it was it was exactly like that. And, yeah. uh, you know, you, you, you'd, you'd go into the house and you had to, right then you were God because, and I know that's blasphemous, but when you walk into a place, you are the one focal point. Nobody's to look away from you. And when you tell them, if this, then that, and they don't understand it, you have to make, you have to, you have to, you have to show them your series. So that's what I did. I did that for a long time, a really, really long time. And uh, it got me my drugs free. It got me my booze free. It got me into where I wanted to be, VIP stuff. That, it was like being in the mob without being in the mob. There's a lot of stuff I don't really want to talk about about it because mm -hmm. because I like how people look at me now. And so now is what I like to focus on. Sure, sure. And, and now is better than that because I would walk into supermarkets and honest to God, mothers would pick up their kit. Mm -hmm. It was that vibe that you put out. And my mind was as toxic as it could possibly be. Sure. You know, if you want to do a rail of like... Agent Orange, I don't think it would be as toxic as I was. And <clears throat> it was, I'm glad that part of my life is over. Sure. And, uh, I don't miss it. I sure. don't think back anymore and think, well, I sure wish I'd done this. I don't. I don't want anything to do with it. I just want to be Kev. Mm -hmm. But all that being said, still good at fighting. <laughs> so right. that's why I'm the security guy. That's why I do all these things that I do now where, you know, I, I'm going to put me in front of anything that's going to hurt this ministry. I'm always going to do that. It's always been my thing. Sure. And and I got a lot of reasons for wanting to do it. Mm -hmm. But the most of all is because this ministry changed my life. Street Life Ministries is able to serve 40,000 meals and help around 20 people permanently get off the streets every year because of our amazing volunteers and donors. And these numbers are great, but we feel God is calling us to do more. In one year, we want to double these numbers, and if we get enough donations, we can make it happen. So, if you are not a monthly donor yet, maybe now is the time to start. It feels pretty great being a part of this powerful movement. Just go to streetlifeministries.org and click donate. Again, that is streetlifeministries.org and you click donate. Now let's get back to the show. Sure. You sure. know, I, I, I'm not so, the guy I was. So before we get into that, because that's a, that's a good... Yeah, it's a good segue into some other stuff, but wow, that's okay. That's pretty deep. That was, that yeah. was cool. Thanks for sharing that. That was yeah. pretty cool. So, um, I do want to go into another area before okay. before Street Life Ministry. So we know I know you have a daughter. <clears throat> oh yeah. She's you know I know that you're uh, super blessed to have her in your life. Yeah. Um, yes. and I met your ex. She came to Street Life, right? So I, obviously she's been to Street Life a couple times, and I didn't oh, yeah. know until until you introduced her to me. <laughs> so, um, how old were you when I had Laura? Yeah. I was, oh, if I get this wrong, okay, it's going to have a field day, but I think I was 24. Okay. 25. No, I was 25. I was 25. <laughs> when I was 50, she was 25, so uh, we're cool. There, there we you go. go. That's all right. Yeah. So, so um, you guys got married, we obviously. Got married. How long I were you guys married no for? I idea what I was getting into. Oh, yeah. whopping four months. <laughs> we yeah. lived actually together yeah. longer than we were even married. We, uh. Well, you beat me. My first marriage only was a, was a year, so you beat me on that. So. Yeah, well, lucky me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, both of us, both of us, not very healthy in our past. Hey, man. Right? So, you know, I did it once. I've been there. I've done that. I've got the emotional scars, and I'm finished. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. So, um, so were you, um, were you in your daughter's life? <clears throat> not as much as I wanted to be. Because okay. here's the thing. Back back then. Uh, I was still kind of active in what I'd been doing. Mm -hmm. And my biggest fear was that what I was doing was going to fall back on the ex and my daughter. And I couldn't allow that to happen. Right. So 
I don't, I, I got so overprotective of them that it became a, it became a, a, well, I was doing a disservice for the job I was trying to do. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't do things the way I used to do. And uh, it also made for a lot of much harder questions because when your kid asks you a question, you answer it, mm -hmm. you know? And I couldn't. Mm -hmm. Dad, where'd all the money come from? Can't tell you. You know, uh, uh, oh my God, honey, this really comes at the, at the right time, but where did, where'd you get it from? Uh, I can't tell you, to my wife, you know? I, it was stupid. It was mm -hmm. just flat out stupid. Getting high paying jobs so that they'd think the money came from there. A lot of times the money, I didn't even go to a job. It was, uh, yeah, my kid changed everything. Mm -hmm. She changed everything and, and I'm glad she did. I'm glad she did, but uh, it was rough there for a while because uh, cause you can't give an answer. You sure. Know? You know, hey, Dad, where'd the money come? Well, I had to choke this fool out, <laughs> you know, and then, and then, you know, hang him upside down and shake out all the money out of his pockets, honey. And yeah, that's not something you want to tell your kids. Sure. You know? sure. So uh, I think really my kid ended up getting the same kind of father that I had who was never there you know mm -hmm. and the thing was I really I'm still here so my problem was I wanted to be that guy but I couldn't be that guy because I was this other guy and the two guys weren't meshing together at all and quite honestly the one that used to do all the crazy stuff wanted to kick the crap out of the one that wasn't and it just became a mess it just it took a long time to get out of that so in between there and um and and that aspect of your life and then obviously not doing it anymore what when were you always at that point were you always kind of just couch surfing and kind of living on the streets did you i mean i know obviously no, when you were married you had a place right yeah i see i see where you're going and yeah uh i wasn't homeless homeless until this last time about 10 years ago um before that i was homeless only because i didn't feel like being at home so I consider homelessness where you run out of all of the other options and now you're seriously outside without a house. That makes you homeless, right? Sure. And that's, that's where I was. Uh, the ex-wife didn't want anything to do with me. The kid didn't want anything to do with me. You know, virtually no one wanted anything to do with me unless I was getting them drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that whole thing started to really suck. And all of a sudden I started to get my mind right and realized this isn't how I want things to be. Um, that took a long time though, because I was a mess. Mm -hmm. All the free dope, I mean, I'm not gonna kid you, I did a lot of dope, you know, and, and I thought I was a master of the universe, but I'm not, I'm just some punk with an attitude problem going around kicking people's butts for money. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what I was. And I couldn't make it right with this new guy that's trying to step up and say, hey, I'm, I'm right here. You know, and, and trying to push the two together to make one wasn't going to work because this guy didn't want anything to do with stupid guy. And, and uh, it was messing up my head a lot. I spent a lot of time. I, I, I would, uh, Rick is my mentor, right? And we were hanging out all the time and talking and, and I'm telling him different stuff. And when I first started talking to him, I went through another, I, I, I feel like I've burned through a lot of people with a cloth <laughs> because, because uh, uh, with Rick, when I was telling him what was up and everything, he looked at me dead in the face on our second meeting and said, am I going to be okay, dude? Is my family going to be okay? And I realized right then, I can't really tell anybody. I can't really tell them the extent of what I was doing, and, and which works out. It works out good now anyway, because because I don't want to be that guy. So if somebody asks me now, I'll tell them, but I'll just tell them real matter of fact. And, and you know, it, it, it seems like I have no soul because of that. I assure you I do. <laughs> but uh, uh, working through with Rick, that was a big deal. Then hooking with Vicky and getting, getting to live over there, that was, that was it. That was it. Once that started happening and gelling and you know, she doesn't, I mean, even if she does want to kill me, she'll wait till I'm awake. <laughs> so, 
there's that. Am I missing anything? I feel like I'm missing something. No, you're doing good. Yeah? No, okay. you're doing good. Uh, so, so Vicky finally got sick and tired. I tried really hard when I was cleaning my act up and everything. I stopped doing the drugs. And, and I was working really hard on not being one of those stupid tweaker dudes that you usually see in the same predicament I was. And uh, there was a whole bunch of stuff happening at the tweaker house I was living at. And uh, it, it was just, it was simply, that was how much money I had, you know? I mean, I was living in a, a, a tool shed and, and trying to make things work, but I was. And I was looking up at the roof, because back when I was homeless, tents had these flappy ass roofs. Sorry about my mouth, but seriously, that's one thing we can't change here. It's these flappy friggin' roofs drive me bats. They drive me nuts. And and <clears throat> so when I wasn't in a tent anymore and I looked up and saw corrugated steel, I really thought I was moving on up. And, and it's sad, but it's true. And uh, so that's why I was in a garden shed. But like I said, Garden said we couldn't handle, the Garden said cannot be a bastion against all the tweakers in Redwood City. There's just no way. <laughs> so, so I ended up, uh, I finally ended up leaving. We grabbed all my stuff. Vicky said, just, you know, get it in the van, get it up here. So, okay, fine. And we did that. And that, yeah, so far, so, so good. You know, I, I don't know where I'm going to be in 10 years, but neither does anybody who's watching this video. <laughs> so. So that that okay so yeah because you kind of uh, talked about a couple couple things there where it kind of goes in between the video oh yeah yeah right yeah. and and what you're sharing so let me uh, kind of <coughs> so back that up a second and, and go so I remember you came to Street Life Ministries because because you heard we were giving away free stuff yeah right? so you <laughs> came was Tom dude yeah so you came to Street Life you got some free stuff and then um, and then you kept coming back. And then I remember, uh, um, I remember coming to you and saying, "Hey, look, I can't seem to get more than twelve people here." Oh yeah. And uh, and I said, Is, "Do you have you know?" Because you were talking about how you knew everybody on the street, and I said, "Okay, if you know everybody on the street, I need people to show up." And I remember the very following dude, week, that's what I got ended up with me like, in the street church, dude. Yeah, I had like right 80, 80, 80 or one hundred people show up, <laughs> and I was like, I couldn't believe it. And um and I had uh at the time we were sharing that lot with Miss Shirley. Yeah. And Miss Shirley was cooking food for us to make sure that we could feed everybody. <laughs> and blessed. I was just I was so blown away. I couldn't believe how many people showed up. And I was like, okay, this guy's the real deal. Like I I couldn't believe it. I appreciate it. And um and that was kind of like that's basically how Street Life Ministries has been ever since. I mean we have a lot of the same people. Oh yeah. You know, we're what, uh ten years in Redwood City now? Yeah. Right? How long have you been off the streets? Uh, coincidentally, about ten years. <laughs> has it been? Has it been? Well, it's been. It's been. Uh, it's been about eight, eight years. Change. Eight yeah. and change. Because you, because you were coming to Street Life for about a year and a half. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, and so it's been, it's been, it's been about nine, almost ten years that we've been. Oh yeah. In Redwood City for sure. Heck yeah. Yes, yeah, two locations now. So yeah, yeah that's it's it's unbelievable. Yeah, so gosh, I, I I'm just sitting here kind of dumbfounded. Like it, time has gone by so fast. It's, it really it's unbelievable. has, man. Um, so, um, because you, you mentioned Rick, yeah, you know Rick Carboneau, Rick right? Who, who, who's 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 part of uh, is our pastor and RGC yeah. and stuff like that. And so, um, to go back a little bit, so you, I remember you when you were living in the shed, yeah. and I remember seeing that shed, and I was like, it, I, I, it's funny to hear that you say that was a come up, and I thought I'm thinking to myself that was not a come up, Dude, but no, but it, it was the roof. No, no, I I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. I I. I get what you're saying. I just totally, I'm just thinking to myself, that's like looking at where you live now to where that is. That's oh, not, dude, yeah, that's not a come up. Yeah, not even close. <laughs> but, um, so what, when, when, when was your, when was your aha moment when you said, okay, like, I know you, I know you said a few minutes ago, it was in, it's been in messing with you in your head, your lifestyle stuff. But when, when was your aha moment? Like you said, okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to make a claim and I'm going to change. Uh, I think my kid hadn't spoken to me in about five years. And all of you guys were telling me, you know what, you just got to send her an email. You just got to just let her know you're thinking of her. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good idea. And I was sitting there one night and uh, 
I saw my brother posted something, and then my daughter had answered him. And so I figured, go for broke, right here, right now. Let's just do it. So, so I did, and uh, I'd been a good boy for a while by then, but I didn't really feel worthy. You know, and, and the only way I was going to ever feel worthy is if my kid wanted, a, you know, anything to do with her dad. Is that one, that one had me messed up for a long time. But uh, turned out she did. And uh, things have been pretty awesome since then. Things have been real. And that was the aha. It was, I realized that if I don't change myself, if I don't, you know, I can't keep thinking, you know, well, you mouth off to me, I'm going to make a phone call. Instead of doing that, just shake my head and walk away from them when they mouth off or whatever. Try to, I got to, I got to earn this. I got to earn this. And, and my kid is something that, well, I guess most people with their kids, they just think, well, I had you, you're mine. I never felt like I deserved mine. Mine was... To me, she was the be all and all, and she, uh, she still is. But that was it, was finally going forward to talk to her and her deciding she actually wanted to have a relationship with me. I had to be worth it. And that was my aha moment. Okay. That was absolutely it. And that's when you felt like Christ was really coming yeah. more in your life? Yeah. Is that moment? Okay. Well, I've been going through it. I've been talking with Carbono and and... At one point, I told Carvino, dude, I don't get it, but ever since I've been a Christian, my life's been friggin' harder. <laughs> you know? Well, that's true. You know, I just assume, you know, it's great. I walk outside, I feel like I'm getting stepped on like a beer can, you know? And, uh, but then all of a sudden, that stuff came through with low, and that changed everything. It, it did. That was it. Okay. Now, um, I don't know if you want to get into this part of it, but I know that you and your mom had a little bit of a, uh, 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 a terrible, uh, kind of a tear in your past, but then I don't, I know that you guys have uh, since then have kind of made an amends with each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't talk for a decade. <laughs> From 2010 to 2020. Uh, Let's just put it this way for anybody who's listening. I remember if I even brought your mom up, I was told to shut the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you were. And, so um, was everyone and, else. So was everyone else. <laughs> And I think I brought your mom up a couple times, yeah. and it was the same. Shut the, you know what? Oh, yeah. up. And then, so I dropped it. And then I remember um, we were going through. I think we were going through Matthew. Yeah. And it was about it was about like anger, resentment. There was there, there was this, there was a couple sermons that Rick taught upon taught yeah. on. And next thing I know, you're like, hey, I I called my. I went over and saw my mom. Yeah. See, so, so talk about that. So, I was. so what what was that like? I mean, so... That was weird, dude. That was weird because, oh, uh, well, because I hadn't seen her in 10 years. You know, I had pretty much erased that part of my life for a while because cause, uh, without getting into why we stopped talking or anything, mm -hmm. uh, I was pretty bitter about it all. And uh, my grandma had passed away too and... and a lot of things just didn't line up the way they were supposed to, and, and it got worse instead of better. And I, honestly, I think kind of my mom was kicking me out of the nest so that I would go do something finally, you know, something worth a damn instead of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But I was still pretty bitter about it, so we didn't talk for 10 years, you know, and even after the 10 years was officially up, uh, I wasn't sure I wanted to. And then Carbon started up with those damn messages, dude. And I knew what he was doing when he did it. <laughs> and and it, it stuck, and I decided, screw it, I'm gonna go talk to my mom. And, and things have been pretty good, man. I mean, you know, she's getting older. And she was, she was what, 26 when she had me or something like that? 24 or 26. And so I'm 51, almost 52, <laughs> you know, so. The years aren't going backwards, so she's got uh, COPD, and, and she's, you know, it's a lot of house for her. And uh, my brother and her have a really good relationship. Me and my mom's is more, let's call it delicate right now. Yeah. Yeah. You and your brother have a pretty good relationship now? 
my brother from the day, the day my grandmother died, my brother showed up with a friend. I didn't know who the friend was at first, but his name was Danny Munson. Danny, I never forgot you. And Danny was there to make sure my brother didn't drink. Me and my brother didn't get along because he would get drunk and then talk smack to me, which is not a good way to do things. Mm -hmm. And so after that, Rich got two years, then he's got five years, then he's got nine years. He's up to 14 years now, I think it is. Mm -hmm. He's a powerhouse. He's got a fantastic job. He's got a fantastic girlfriend living in, in Santa Clara in a, uh, his own house, really. Yeah. He's doing real good, man. And, and yeah, we, me and him, we get along great now. I used to want to be the first one to throw him underneath the bus while it was taken off, but not anymore. Not anymore. Me and my bro are on the same team. Yeah. Yeah. So would you say in the last 10 years, you feel like there's been a lot of growth in your life? Oh, dude. Yeah. Yeah. That's just this last 10 years. Yeah. I mean... I'm sure 20 years from now, when I look back, it'll be like, oh, well, it's a lot longer than that. But yeah, so far, this last 10 years has been the money, dude. This is this has been it, because this is as real as I get, you know? This yeah. is as, as uh, I don't know, I like to I like to keep a certain amount of, I, I like to keep people wondering about me, but. Uh, yeah, you do a good job with that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I this is me now. I'm here, you know, and I'm not sorry anymore. You yeah. know, this is just me. Yeah. And you take it or you leave it. You yeah. know, I've got my opinions. My opinions are pretty ingrained. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna try to change my opinion, you better come with your A game. Yeah. You know? Other than that, I, I, I'm the gate guy at, at Street Life. Yeah. I look out for my people, my people look out for me. We're great. So when you say you're the gate guy at Street Life Ministries, what is, I mean, I'm the you, bouncer, dude. Well, <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, let's but let's let's go a little bit deeper than that for people, right? So, so yeah, okay. So you're you're the peacemaker if some if something goes haywire, which is your technical role, right? Right. Right. Which I get that, but I think it's more than that, right? So. Yeah. I've noticed since you've been in that role, because people have respect for you on the streets, you have a little bit more latitude yeah. than I do yeah. as the pastor, right? Oh, yeah. um, so therefore, in, in a lot of ways, you're able to get things across to the homeless community in ways that like I can't. Right, right, right. right. So it's, I think it's more than just being the gate guy. Yeah, well, it works out, it works out good. They, they work in tandem, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because when I, 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 like I said, I don't live over here anymore. I, I left here because of the drugs. <laughs> but I come back Monday and Wednesday, and, and Monday and Wednesday is where I meet up with my folks and say, hey, and they come to see us. They get some God too. Things go really well, but yeah, it's, it works out really well where I'm at because it's very central. To where all the the homeless folks I know are. Yeah. I used to be able to sit at at, at the St. Anthony's and, and tell each name as they walked up and got a tray. I used to be able to do that, and and it's been so long now I can't. And sometimes I think, you know what? Well, then maybe you need to go back and start learning again. Mm. You know, I don't know when I'm going to do that, but I keep telling myself I need to. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Well, I kind of feel like I feel like there's like, you know. There's there's us pastors who are sharing the word of God to those who are in the chairs listening to the word of God, and then I feel like you are kind of like your own minister over at the gate, like you've got your own ministry going on. Because let's just face it, there's 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 you know we any we have anywhere between sixty to seventy people that come to the ministry. We get twenty to thirty people that are up front listening to the word, but then we've got another fifteen to twenty people that are at the gate smoking cigarettes and hanging out. And and you got your own ministry going on over there, and and in, in a lot of ways, it, it's it's all one ministry. It's Absolutely. we're all serving the Lord, but we're just serving people in a different way. So I think yeah. what you do is more than just a gate guy. I think it's more vital than that. I think it's. I appreciate that. You know, yeah, check and see how people are doing. What you know? Right. Somebody had a, a big fight the other day. Okay, well then I need to talk to them. You know that kind of stuff. It works out pretty good. Well, and you can you're you're a good you're a good. Um, how do I say it? You're a good uh, thermometer to tell what the temperature's like when somebody comes oh, in. Absolutely. So you know 
pretty much right off the bat, like oh, yeah. if somebody's going to be a problem or not. Well, most of the time, because yeah, because I know me, and I know most of the time, yeah, I'm a problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah, you know, I just kind of match them up to me. We have a couple every now and then, right? Yeah, it's been a while now, though, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. been a while now, yeah. and I'm happy with that. Yeah. Well, you know what I've, you know what I really think you and I both share um, in common is, is that coming from our past, I've got 15 years in recovery and okay. you know and what i think is interesting is how you and i both um have acquired friendships within the local police department yeah Isn't which is weird? which is only god because uh, i mean I, like i'm friends with like almost every cop in redwood city now yeah you are and you you're friends with the chief of police and, and his and his wife's buying you coffee Sorry, and, love, Sorry. yeah and um and and it's just it's like you know i i uh i i laugh I, I laugh to myself over that because I just right. find myself like thinking there's it's just Dan, no Dan. other way I could have done this. This is all God, right? So it's Dan, man. Yeah. <sighs> Pretty cool, huh? I'm proud of him though, dude. I'm yeah. proud of him. He's yeah. a good one, dude. He's one of the good ones. Cool. So listen, any final thoughts you got you would like to share as we close in? Uh stick around and see how it turns out. that That's the most important one, because I'm still sticking around because I want to see how this turns out. I've been working my ass off to fix myself, and and sometimes I'm doing good, other times I'm saying ass on camera. <laughs> so, it, you stick around and see what the changes are. You know what I'm saying? Just, just kind of, you know, just that. Stick around and see what the changes are, because there's going to be a change, and you're going to be glad. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin, for taking time to come here and, and sharing your testimony with Anytime. us. All right, I love you, man. I love you, bro. God bless you, bro. You too. All right, bye.